Hey friends, it's Tim Viegas from the Maryland Coalition for Inclusive Education. And you are listening to or watching Think Inclusive, our podcast that features conversations with people doing the work of inclusion in the real world. Artificial intelligence has been a hot topic for a for quite a while in education. Uh, But here is what I haven't heard talked a lot about AI in the development of individualized education programs. Now, today's guest is Dr. Andrea Harkins Brown, and she's the program director for disability policy and systems change and an assistant research scientist at the Center for Technology and Education within Johns Hopkins University in the School of Education. We have a really fascinating conversation about how schools and districts could possibly use AI in the development of IEPs. Now she and her team at Johns Hopkins are working on something with regard to this idea. And I don't think it's fully formed yet, but I think that our conversation will lend itself to just maybe us being open to the possibility that educators could use this for IEP development. So as you are listening to this conversation, I'd love to know what you think about this idea. If this is a bad idea, if this is a great idea, just let me know. You can always email me at tviegas at mcie.org. That's T-V-I-L-L-E-G-A-S at M-C-I-E dot O-R-G. Before we get into our conversation with uh, Dr. Harkins Brown, I want to tell you about our sponsor for this season. We have a fantastic sponsor. It's IXL. Maybe you've heard about it. With IXL, you get a personalized online learning and teaching solution that helps educators improve achievement, track progress, and empower the teachers at your school. This one platform is for kindergarten through 12th grade, and it really just helps teachers accomplish what would normally require dozens of other tools. With just the one platform, teachers can personalize learning for every learner. And IXL gives teachers the tools they need to enhance and differentiate instruction without adding work to their plate. As students practice the skills in IXL, IXL automatically adapts to ensure each learner is always supported and challenged at the right level. IXL also provides every student with a personalized learning plan to help them close knowledge gaps effectively. If that sounds interesting to you, check out IXL.com slash inclusive That's IXL.com slash inclusive. Okay, after a short break, we'll be back with my conversation with Dr. Andrea Harkins-Brown. See you on the other side. Andrea Harkins Brown, welcome to the Think Inclusive podcast. Thank you. Uh, Andrea, how are you connected to special education? I see a John, for those of you watching on YouTube, I, uh, there is a Johns Hopkins University flag right behind you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so how are you connected to special education in Maryland and, uh, Johns Hopkins? Uh, well, I, thank you for having me. Um, I am, uh, an assistant research scientist, uh, in the Johns Hopkins university school of education, um, in the center for technology and education. Um, and my background is that I was a special educator. Um, I worked in public schools, uh, in Maryland, actually, um, serving students who have autism, and other significant cognitive disabilities. Um, But now the work that I do and a lot of the work that we do at CTE um, is about supporting 
um, states and local school districts um, to provide um, high quality special education services um, for children who have disabilities. And could you, uh, the, the, you mentioned an acronym CET, CTE, can you explain what that is for our audience? Absolutely. Um, so a CTE stands for the Center for Technology and Education. Um, we are a research center in Johns Hopkins um, School of Education. Um, and all of the work that we do um, is funded through um, external funding, so grants and, and contracts and things. Uh, so we do work related to early childhood education, um, readiness for school, and also special education, uh, both research and implementation. Right. Um, so uh, you were a special education, special educator uh, in, early in your career. What how, what was your path to research? What was my path? Well, so I started out uh, teaching elementary age students with disabilities. Um, I also taught three and four year olds um, with autism and a really um, what I think was unique at the time program sort of reverse inclusion model. Um, so we followed a model that was being used at the time by Kennedy Krieger Institute. Um, and so about 80% of my students were students um, who had disabilities or communication disorders, and the others were typical peers. Um, and so um, after that time, I transitioned um, to a central office position, um, providing instructional support and compliance support um, to schools throughout a pretty large district in Maryland. Um, and then I was afforded the opportunity to come to higher ed. Uh, I worked um, at Towson University. Um, for close to 10 years, um, training pre-service teachers um, and working in our, our graduate programs. Um, and uh, then transitioned to Johns Hopkins um, as a researcher. But while I was at uh, Towson, um, I did my doctoral degree in instructional technology. Um, so I've always been kind of a, a technology geek. Um, and really excited about the ways that it could be leveraged um, to support students with disabilities in really unique ways um, and how teachers think about using technology um, as one tool, right, in their arsenal. Um, not that technology replaces the teacher, but it's another tool that he or she can use to really reach learners who, who maybe wouldn't even be able to access learning um, mm. Without it, so I, I'm not sure that I intended to come to higher mm. education and academia, um, but I'm glad I'm here. Um, but I really like sort of the applied aspect of you know how can we do work that's meaningful, right? Like not research just for research sake, um, but how could we actually do it in a way that like we can move the needle um, for all kinds of kids? And so that's what that's what I love about C being at CTE. Um, is that I get to go out and spend time in classrooms and schools and and working with with leaders um, to to make a difference. Yeah, that must be really rewarding uh, to be to have the, all that experience as a teacher in in a classroom and in a school, and then go to a place where you can do some research that benefits um, people that 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 you are interacting with whether that's in a school building or in a classroom absolutely and to see i think to really um sort of get ingrained in the culture of a school district or even working with the state agency like what are the contexts there that are happening that are sort of keeping keeping things we want to happen right from not moving at the pace we want right like what are the systems in place um that, that prevent students from making growth or prevent them from being included, right? And so I think a lot of that work I've learned has to do with just having relationships mm -hmm. with those leaders, having relationships with folks who are making decisions, even in an IEP team, right? Like a lot of the work that we do um, is attitudinal, right? Sort of mm -hmm. trying to shift hearts and minds, Um for me, I think, you know, people, people's hearts and minds get shifted toward inclusivity in a whole variety of ways. Um, some people need sort of qualitative information and then some people need like 
quantitative, like, right. They need like, show me the cold, hard facts about the fact that it works. Um, so to me, I think that that, um, is fun being able to show them results, um, from rigorous studies that say, actually students who spend 80% or more of their day in the general education classroom, regardless of their ability level, produce or realize far better outcomes than students who have lesser degrees of inclusion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And the research proves that over and over and over again. Um, it does. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> so thank you for bringing that up. Um, so Andrea, you and I have known each other for a few years now, but we've really yeah. only connected uh, in real life at CEC, which I think is uh, interesting. Um, so we were at, so Andrea and and um, I were on a joint panel. Uh, well, it was a joint se- a concurrent session. I can't remember how you say it, but it was a session at CEC in Orlando a few years ago. And then Carolyn Teaglin, the CEO, our CEO, and myself attended a, a session that you you did at uh, CEC in San Antonio just this last year. And so we we started talking and I was kind of asking like, hey, what do you do? Like, what are you doing? Like, what kind of projects you're working on at Johns Hopkins? Um, you know, mm-hmm. I'd love to have you on. And you mentioned something about artificial intelligence. And I thought that, that was a really interesting topic. So would you mind sharing the project you're working on and let's just see where that goes. I I think that our audience would find that really interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that we, like a lot of people are still in this sort of fact finding mission and asking questions about what is the potential here, right? Um, For artificial intelligence to help us um, be able to, frankly, from my perspective, maybe remove um, some burden from teachers um, as it relates to compliance, paperwork, mm-hmm. right? Like, um, and so I, I wouldn't suggest that we have all the answers to those questions <laughs> yet. I think we're still very much like in the conceptual phase, but. One of the things that we hear from teachers and that we see being produced in the research, the qualitative research right now about teacher burnout, especially those who are serving students with disabilities, is folks are leaving the profession largely because of what they perceive to be the working conditions, right? And oftentimes they cite um, the burden of paperwork, right? Um, not just attending the meetings and being involved in the conversations, right? I think that many of us would agree that that's valuable and time well spent, right? But because so much of the law is related to procedural compliance, I as a special educator would spend a lot of time making sure that I had dotted my I's and crossed my T's, right? So that element of procedural compliance, right? Um, Whether we have all the boxes checked, whether we've done it in 60 or 90 days, whether we have sort of taken the time to make sure that we've got all of the assessment information loaded into the IEP in a comprehensive way. That takes time. And I think at least what what I'm finding in the districts that we're working with is as the number of special education teacher vacancies have increased, then that burden of workload has become even greater amongst those who are still there, right? So it's sort of like reaching this fever pitch of, you know, I am taking work home with me. I think this has always been there because I remember doing this as a new special educator, right? I was taking my work home. I was taking my lesson plans home. I was committed to it. I was working working on it all weekend. Um, But what I hear teachers describing right now, it feels like a pretty different season than when I was in the classroom, right? Like the workforce is really changing and and they're stretched. Um, So I think the questions that we're starting to ask at CTE are, you know, what are some ways that AI can help you from, uh, help you be able to 
you know, do so much I dotting and T crossing, right? To allow you to spend your time on having really good, rich discussions in an IEP meeting, right? And really get back to the work of focusing on what's most important, which is implementing the IEP, right? Um, and so, you know, we have uh, started working, um, particularly in Maryland, talking to the folks who who are developing Maryland's or have developed Maryland's online IEP platform to say, what are some ways that we might be able to automate some elements of, of writing the actual IEP, right? Um, and, you know, I think some of the conversations that we've had about that is, gosh, folks are going to feel apprehensive. Mm-hmm. People may feel as though, well, wait a minute, right? Andrea is the special educator. It's her job to develop this part of, of the IEP. And it is, right? Like the law says it is, right? And not the knowledgeable providers are going to be the ones making. But could AI make some suggestions to me, right? And then I could approve or decline that suggestion. Um, could AI tell me about some evidence based practices that may really be a great fit for this student based on all of the assessment information that I've fed the system, right? So without me having to spend hours looking for that. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I think we're, we're asking ourselves and um, testing and trying and, and maybe, maybe even piloting um, mm-hmm. in, in the future. So at this point, it's really just conceptual. We're just, just figuring out what what are the questions that we need to be asking um, on how to support an educator uh, with uh, with just the the task of writing the IEP. Uh, and I'm right there with you. I remember writing my first IEP. Uh, this was in early 2000s. Um, and the, the practice at the time was handwriting, yes. handwriting the IEP. And I felt like I was um, on the cutting edge because I got a fillable <laughs> PDF. <laughs> yes. Tim, I remember taking floppy disks home, uh-huh. okay, and putting them. Actually, I remember that my students' files had floppy disks taped with masking tape to the inside of their folder. Um, and yes, that felt kind of cutting edge at the time. We've evolved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Um, I can definitely see how, how an educator would become uh, apprehensive about mm-hmm. even entertaining this sort of thing because, I mean, you just look, you look at the culture, right? And how... Uh, society is very split on the usefulness of artificial intelligence uh, in our in our own lives, and uh, I think that um, I think it it could it could there's potential um, you know for harm in a lot of different areas, uh, but it, it, as a way to cut down on paperwork, uh, and I'll give you an example in in not in education, but in my line of work, which is communications. So, um, and specifically this podcast. So we have an AI uh, tool that we use called Decipher. And, uh, I, you know, before we use this tool, I would listen to the podcast episode uh, interview over and over again and pull out different things and summarize the episode myself and um, kind of uh, when I'm promoting it, when I'm doing the show notes, when I'm, when I'm writing copy about the episode, that took a lot of brain power for me to do that. Now I can take the audio of the episode, put it into decipher and decipher uh, analyzes the episode and creates a model or a template of show notes, uh, summarizes the contents of the, of the discussion, uh, pulls out some key takeaways, uh, even pulls out quotes, 
Uh, also, I can, as as the communications director, can look at the content and say, "Oh, I like that. I don't like that. I don't think, I don't think the summary, I don't think the summary is quite right there." And I can edit that summary, and then I can use that content to uh, publish our episode, um, and that saves that saves me hours of work. And mm-hmm. I think that in a similar fashion. AI or an AI tool could um, analyze a bunch of different information, either about a student or about service, about services, and either make suggestions or pre-write some of the some of the the text that needs to go into an IEP. Um, and I think you know, best practices aren't we're not just going to copy and paste, but that it's a way to save and streamline uh, the process so the educator doesn't have to spend as much time with it. So do you see that as a parallel? I, I do. And I think, you know, for those of us who are are ready to take an honest look at the way we write IEPs, I think we've got to ask ourselves whether the ways that we're doing it right now are in fact better. Mm. or 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 even best practice than what we're looking at with AI, right? Um, you know, most folks aren't going to widely publicize, gosh, you know, when I run out of time, I copy <laughs> and paste the child's last IEP from last year. But the reality is that we do that. We do mm-hmm. that when we are stretched to of the time that we have, right? Like we're trying to you know, balance, balance our responsibilities. Um, so, I, you know, I think one of the things that is important to us, right, we're a research center. One of the things that is important to us is, right, we're not building a tool just to build a tool, right? We're not building, building a tool because we, we want to be able to make money on a tool, right? There's plenty of, of companies out there doing that. The questions that we are trying to ask ourselves are, first of all, the reality is that if if we aren't, this is my opinion, if we are not doing this work, someone else will do this work. Mm. And might those algorithms for how to develop IEPs be programmed in a way that we believe are not ethical, right? How do we ensure that those algorithms mitigate bias, right? And so it, to me, I think we have a responsibility to be involved, right? Researchers, those who have knowledge about the law, we have a responsibility to include ourselves in the development of this so that we know that it comes out right. Um, and so if we don't do it, someone else will, right? So, so that's one idea. Um, and the other is that, you know, we've got to be able to really ask ourselves some honest questions about, gosh, when when I'm writing, we're getting ready to start a research study this upcoming year that looks at, you know, what what is the professional's implicit bias that they bring to developing the IEP, right? And it, And whether that be information that I have, and maybe, maybe I've got some ableist biased that I'm not aware of, right? I've read your evaluation results. I've seen your I does that impact the placement that I'm going to recommend for you, right? I, I may recommend that placement just because you've always had services there, right? And I've looked at the evaluation results and I've been trained in this deficit based model. And I'm going to decide that's what's best for you, right? And so if we can program in a way that allows you to make some other, uh, take some other suggestions into consideration, right? It's this objective third party um, saying, have you considered this? Um, Then I think it really maybe opens the doors. Um, You know, sometimes the argument is, well, the algorithms are going to be biased, right? So my answer to that would be, they could be, but so are people. Right. Um, and so uh, the other thing that I, you know, as it relates to sort of the ethics of, of using AI, um, 
you know, I think we are pretty to, we need to test something and make sure that it's working or that frankly, it's even working better than the old way before it would be something that we would use large scale, right? So from an evaluation perspective, I'd be interested to know how does a group of IEPs that people have written, right? The typical process, what's the quality of those IEPs, right? Both procedurally and, right? Like, is the child making progress, receiving, deriving benefit, right? What does the quality of those IEPs look like? And then how does that compare to the quality of IEPs produced with AI sort of as the the tutor, right? Um, And I think we've got a responsibility to sort of make sure that it's that we're actually deriving some benefit out of the tool um, before it's something that goes large scale. What worries me as a researcher is that that's not always how ed tech companies function, right? It's sort of build it, deploy it, maybe check later to make sure that it works, but as a, as a, a sales approach, right? Um, to me, I think it's important that we do that evaluation on the front end, right? So that we are, are doing no harm um, to the families and students and providers um, that we're supporting with the tool. And with the state of Maryland having an online IEP infrastructure, this seems like an ideal, um, there's, there's some runway, of course, but uh, it, it, you know, just in, in the next few years to be able to test and then uh, possibly even implement this into that state system, right? Absolutely. I think that there's interest um, in the state of Maryland to sort of explore what this could look like. Um, and, and my my sense is um, that this conversation is happening all over, right? Um, all across. Um, what folks are sort of asking themselves. Also, like, how can we be responsive to to teachers and to the users of these systems um, who are asking for pretty pretty seismic changes, um, right? Help help make this system work for us and facilitate this process for children and families. Um, I mean, I know I've sat in um, just interviews or focus groups with parents and heard them talk about, gosh, sometimes when I'm in an IEP team meeting, I feel like the person that I'm there to talk to is staring at the computer, right? And and the, the process itself um, is intimidating enough, right? Um, and so how could we get folks, you know, could, could we do something on the technology end that, you know, to your point with Decipher, right? Now, instead of spending three hours, I can spend five or 10 minutes, right? Instead of yeah. looking at the computer for an hour, can you be looking at the computer for 10 or 15 minutes in the context of an IEP team? I mean, think how that would change oh, it, the facilitation. It would right? absolutely Like the richness change. of discussions. Um, yeah. What if you could, what if you could take, because since AI is a, it's, you know, uh, it's a language model, right? So what if yeah. you could, and I, it's funny because like, that means you're, you really should be recording IEP meetings, right? Because imagine if every IEP meeting was recorded and all of that language was, was documented, could be analyzed and then um that way discussions are actually like you said rich uh deep and take into consideration all of the voices at the table right uh and then there's less um, there's less time with a person trying to remember everything that was said, pull out all the key points and the key takeaways. Um, I, I just see, I just, I see that this could be a powerful tool, uh, to help IEPs with documentation. Um, but also to really pull out and highlight all the different things that we talk about, uh, in a meeting, 
Yeah, I'm I'm sure not everyone would like meetings recorded. <laughs> um, but I mean, parents have the right to record meetings. Sure. You know, and so do yes. districts. So well, and I'll tell you, in my own experience, I mean, I use the AI note taker companion in Microsoft Teams all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have some folks that I work with who sometimes we'd actually prefer to use Teams instead of Zoom because we like the way the AI tool summarizes our notes mm -hmm. for us. Yeah. Um, and my experience has been that it actually does a really good job of summarizing the notes. And then I can ask, um, oftentimes, you know, I can't, if you're like me, right? Well, I, I have a lot of notes, a lot of agendas, like rolling agendas, and I'm forever going back through meeting minutes and agendas to find the thing that I said I was going to do, mm -hmm. right? And now I find myself doing things like, um, what day did I say I was going to email Tim about the podcast, right? And it will it will tell me. Um, now, <laughs> I also want to say that as a new um, AI user, uh, my, I don't know if this has happened to you, but my experience is I have fallen into the trap of believing that what it tells me is accurate. Mm -hmm. And I have gotten burned a few times, right? Like, I mean, I, I'm a researcher and here I was working quickly, right? And, and I just accepted it as fact and it was wrong, right? right? And so I think of those experiences that you then realize, right, that you need to do your own due diligence and I've got a fact check, but to check on something versus finding it and developing it from scratch, um, is a, is a, it's a different cognitive load, right? And it takes a lot less time. Um, but I, I have learned that it's important, um, <laughs> to, to not just take it, take it as fact. Um, yeah. And yeah. It, sometimes, sometimes that, that incorrect information is, masquerading itself as something that looks like the right answer. Um, logically, it should be, um, but sometimes it's not. Yeah. It, well, and I wonder, you, you know, you brought up um, about doing a research um, that examines if what we're doing right now is actually, you know, better uh, then if we were to use some sort of AI tool, I can, I mean, how many times have, have uh, we both been in IEP meetings where somebody wrote something down that actually either wasn't said or was misinterpreted, you know, and then after the fact, a sure. parent or an educator are like, actually it's, it was this, you know? And so right. I wonder, I wonder if, um, if, the difference is uh, is significant. I you know I I don't know, but I, I think that that's definitely worth exploring. Sure. Well, and I think what I would draw from what you just said is that people make mistakes too. Mm -hmm. um, we make mistakes all the time. I mean, IDEA that is hundreds and hundreds of procedural compliance elements, right? I mean, you're almost never not missing something. Um, but is there a way to to improve it, right? And so, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, anything that you want to uh, share with educators who are maybe thinking about AI uh, for the first time in in this way? And you know, we have a lot of um, teachers, principals, uh, district folk that that listen. Um, so, anything from your perspective that you want to make sure uh, that that they uh, hear or have a takeaway? Um, well, I think. An important takeaway, you know, we, we've spent a majority of this conversation talking about how the IEP gets developed and how it gets written. My experience in, in working with teachers or administrators is that all that is also what we spend a lot of time on, right, is how the IEP gets written. 
And we spend so much less time talking about how it is going to be implemented and how we're going to make sure that the child is, is making progress, right? And so my appeal would be, let's be open to the idea that maybe some of the new technology allows us to have a greater focus on implementation, right? To get back to the business of teaching and really focusing on the implementation of the IEP. Um, because without that, it, it, it almost doesn't matter, right, how we developed it. It doesn't matter if I took four hours to write a beautiful IEP that's procedurally compliant or whether AI helped me do that. Um, the whole purpose behind the endeavor, right, is to make sure that the child is meeting with success, right? So at some point, we've got to then pivot in our conversation um, to, to, is this working? Um, getting what they need? Um, am, I, am I providing the services in a way that they were intended to be provided, right? Um, hopefully, technology allows us to better sort of refocus um, on those things because that that is, I think, ultimately what really matters. It's why most of us are writing an IEP in the first place. Well, I know I am, and I'm sure our audience is looking forward to um what Johns Hopkins and uh, your team will will find out about this um, about bringing AI into the the writing of IEPs. So, um, Andrea, did I, I don't know if you saw the last thing is the mystery question. Or are you up for that mystery question? Sure. Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Okay, <laughs> so I pick a card, and okay. then we both answer the question. So I mixed up the cards before. Oh, this is a good one. Okay. Okay. Sometimes they're deep. And <laughs> this is not this is not a deep one. Not I, I don't think so, anyways. Okay. So which activities make you lose track of time? And I'm holding the which I'm holding the card up to the camera. So if if you're watching on YouTube, you can read the card. So which activities make you lose track mm. of time? Oh gosh, P personal ones or professional ones? I mean, you could I mean, you could answer both. It's really up to you. And if you want me to go first, I can. Yeah, you go first. Okay. <laughs> well, so because you brought it up, um we'll do one professional, one personal. So, professionally, okay. um I lose track of time when I'm editing. <laughs> so, if I'm if uh, I don't have any time constraints and I just am sitting at my computer and I'm listening to a conversation or I'm adding music or doing any sort of editing, I completely lose track of time. I could, it could be five minutes or an hour and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's. <laughs> You're so in it. You're so in I'm it. I'm <laughs> so in it <laughs> that, you know, um, so there's that. And then. Personally, um, I would say probably listening to music. Um, music's a big part of my life, so I will. I have like lots of ways to listen to music. You know, on on the computer, um, I have a, a a record player with with albums with LPs, um, and even when I go on runs, I have my my headphones. So. Usually if I'm listening to music, I am not paying attention to how much time is going by. So those would be my two. Okay. Well, I'm sorry to admit this, but I think my personal one is scrolling. Right? Uh, <laughs> what is that? Like the doom scrolling? Yeah. Like, yeah. right. Like I meant to go to bed 45 minutes ago and I'm still scrolling. Um <laughs> It contributes to sleep patterns. It's and apparently it's not good for your brain, right? To be like looking at, at a screen before you go to sleep. But 
that that for sure is my personal one. It might be like a method of like procrastination too. <laughs> um, so I I'll just go all down a, a rabbit hole um, with that. Um, I think professionally, I I so I read a lot, mm-hmm. um, and sometimes I'll read one thing, and then that leads me to another. And then another, and then another, right? And I was just supposed to sort of find one thing. Um, and now I, I can't stop myself, right? And I feel like, oh gosh, I got to know all the things about that. And probably everybody knows about this thing, but me, I'm behind, right? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So I can lose a lot of time trying to um, bone up on something or, um, so, you know, it, in some ways that might mean that I'm in the right job. Um, but just sort of getting lost um, in in something that's sort of um, happening in other folks' writing is really um, interesting to me. I could just lose a, a half day on that. <laughs> that's great. That yeah, I I feel that. I feel that. I think um, <laughs> the it's like the curiosity just gets the better of you, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. That's right. If I only, we only had more, if I only had more time uh, to do those things, um, and I think for me, that's one of the things that I really enjoy um, about meeting folks like you at CEC and and getting to see um, the work of others, either in other nonprofits or in other universities that are committed to the same mission. Um, so I appreciate your interest because I, you know, I think ultimately we're trying to serve the same mission that you all are. Um, and so to me, it's fascinating just to hear what other people are doing, what kinds of things they're, they're trying. Yeah. Well, no, oh, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being a guest. Um, I totally forgot sure. to ask, uh, where people can find you and if they want to follow you or your, or CTE or anything, did you want to drop any links or, you know, talk about social media or anything like that? Um, I'm glad to share some links with you. Um, CTE does, uh, we are on social media. So um, we are on Twitter and Facebook. And I have to say I am on Twitter as well, but I have a different last name there. I'm on Twitter as Andrea H. Parrish, um, P-A-R-R-I-S-H. Um, but would be glad to share links um, and encourage folks to follow us and learn more about what we do. Andrea Harkins Brown, thank you so much for being on the Think Inclusive podcast. We really appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Welcome back, everyone. It's time for three for me and two for you. So that is that I am going to provide three reflections on the conversation that I had with our guests and then two calls to action. Uh, for you to do. Okay. Number one, I don't think that I am as scared about artificial intelligence as other people. I'm not exactly sure why, but I've always seen AI as a tool. And I don't think that we should be afraid of tools, just like anything that's a tool. I'm going to talk about social media because I think that that is a um a good parallel here social media to me is a tool it's a communication tool Um, a lot of people misuse the tool Um, and so would our lives be better without social media I think our lives would be different but you can put regulations in place so that people don't misuse tools but some people are going to misuse them. And so it's the same thing with AI. I think that AI is a tool. We shouldn't be afraid of the tool. There are certain things that we can put in place to help people not misuse the tool. And so as an, as educators, I, I feel like we should embrace AI. Okay. So that's number one. Uh, number two is if there's a tool that can help educators cut down on the paperwork and just the uh, red tape and bureaucracy of education in general. I'm going to open up my computer here for a second because I uh, I made some notes and I want to make sure I have access to them. I actually looked up the definition 
of red tape and where it came from because <clears throat> I uh, sometimes I just you know sometimes you just say things and you're not really sure why you say them. It's just a phrase that you've been using for years. And I, I did not know this, so I'm going to share this with you. Um, and I haven't a hundred percent fact checked this, but apparently, according to this source, uh, red tape, the reason why they call it red tape is it's an expression from the early, early 16th century when the King of Spain used actual red tape to bundle important documents that needed immediate attention. So the King had to actually physically cut through the red tape to read these documents, which I think is, uh, really, that's, that's a really interesting effect if it's true. So, um, Anything that we can do to cut down the red tape, cut down the just how hard it is to keep up with the paperwork, I think is a good thing. I think AI could help with this immensely. And then the third thing is I'd like for you to think about the possibilities that could open up if we as a field allow AI to do some of the things um, that we've been doing manually. I think you've seen that a little bit with IEPs being online. Uh, I said this when I was talking to Andrea, but when I first started, the the uh, the common practice was to actually hand write the IEPs. I mean, they, there'd be forms and like lines, and you would actually write in IEP goals and your notes and everything like that. Um. It just took so much time. So I think that now that things are online or people are using software, it's definitely cut down. Um, but the content generation is really what I'm talking about. So if it was a way that we could possibly cut down on that part, then we could be spending as educators more time uh, figuring out supports, um, with students and and teaching and uh, collaborating. So, okay, there's uh, two calls to action for you. I want you to check out this resource and um, full disclosure, I have not watched these videos that I'm about to share, but I am confident that they are at least worth checking out because they are produced in conjunction with Educating All Learners Alliance, which MCIE is a part of. And it is um, from AI for Education. And it, it looks like it is a four-part webinar series um, designed to share information about uh, generative AI for special educators. So the series is Harnessing AI in Special Education, a four-part series. And I will drop the link in the show notes. It looks like this was done earlier in 2024, and they are for one-hour webinars, maybe. Um, so it looks great. I'm going to put it as, as a resource. I think you should definitely check it out. So that's number one. Number two is uh, a request about um, the podcast. So if you're listening on Spotify there is a section underneath the episode where you can put a comment or respond to a question or a poll. So what I'm going to do is when this publishes on Spotify, I'm going to ask a question. Have you ever used AI to help with a teacher task? So that's lesson planning, uh, differentiation, uh, maybe it's to come up with ideas for an activity. Um, I just want to get a yes or no. I think it'll just be a poll. So I'm going to put that on Spotify. So if you are listening on Spotify, definitely check out the poll and uh, we'll share the results on social media. If you listen on Apple Podcasts, I'd love for you to answer this question at, in the review section. So if you haven't reviewed our podcast on Apple Podcasts, it would be fantastic if you would leave a five-star review or whatever star you feel like it's uh, we are fitting for. Um, we actually haven't had uh, a ton of reviews 
recently, and it's probably because I haven't been asking. So I'm going to ask specifically if you listen on an Apple podcast, uh, you can do it in the app, or I think that you can do it on the web now since they uh, have given, um, so you can listen to episodes on a web browser use, using Apple podcasts, but Please, if you haven't given a review, check it out. It is a way for people to know that this podcast is beneficial and then also that we are continuing to uh, grow our audience. So we really appreciate it if you did that. All right, that's it for this episode of Think Inclusive. Time for the credits. Think Inclusive is written, edited, designed, mixed, and mastered by me, Tim Villegas, and is a production of the Maryland Coalition for Inclusive Education. Original music by Miles Kredich. Additional music from Melody. Thank you so much to our sponsor for Season 12, IXL. If you want to learn more about IXL, go to IXL.com slash inclusive. And thank you to our listeners and viewers. Uh, So whether you listen on your favorite podcast player or you are watching us on YouTube, please follow, subscribe, and share with your family, friends, and colleagues. We appreciate every time you hit play on one of our episodes. It really means a lot. And if you liked what you heard or saw today, please let me know at tviegas at mcie.org. That's T-V-I-L-L-E-G-A-S at M-C-I-E dot O-R-G. Thanks for your time and attention. And remember, inclusion always works. From MCIE.